Hello and welcome to the Most Maligned Horror Podcast, a show offering critical analysis and contextualization of the horror films of the early 2000s. I am your host, Macaulay Elijah Quinn. I am a filmmaker and film critic, and on today's episode I'll be discussing with you July 2000's They Nest, also known as Creepy Crawlers, which is, I suppose, perhaps a better title in some ways. It's a, it's a more direct title, to be sure. It's a title that really lets you know sort of what you're in for. This is a movie about bugs, uh, not giant bugs, not giant insects, which I thought it would be about. Instead, this is about a particular uh, breed of cockroach, which has the ability to sort of paralyze its victims and then uh, lays eggs inside of their bodies. It's pretty gnarly stuff for a movie that was released to wide audiences on television. That's one of the things I think I've been most surprised with doing this show so far, is looking at all the made-for-TV movies. I'm surprised at just sort of how graphic they are. I suppose I shouldn't be. I suppose that I shouldn't be surprised, because when I sort of think about it, you know, I've always had this perception that, like, um, horror made for children, so, um, like... Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark and um, things like that, things of that nature. A lot of the time, they're not able to be graphic in the way that, you know, more adult oriented horror is. And so instead, they have to be sort of a bit more creative in terms of sort of what actually, what danger the protagonists are, are put into. And in some ways, they end up being more graphic as a result. They end up being sort of a lot more terrifying. So, for instance, in Batman the Animated Series, you know, they weren't able to show people just getting blown away by guns or bombs or whatever. And so instead, you have things like the Joker's laughing gas, which, like, breaks people mentally and, like, disfigures them <laughs> physically. And in some ways, that's, like, significantly worse than if they were just killed if they were just you know shot or stabbed or something like that that's a little easier to sort of grasp whereas the concept of being just completely just to have your humanity completely torn away from you is um you know some way in in some ways that's a lot more harrowing and this was in a show that was ostensibly made for children they nest is a film made for an adult audience i want to be clear about that this is not I, I wouldn't say that this is a, like, family-friendly film, necessarily. But that being said, because it was released on television, because it was broadcast on uh, a national network, it had a lot more oversight than a film going to theatres would have. There was a lot more... It was placed under a lot more sort of immediate scrutiny. And so it's pretty clear that they weren't able to show, you know, a lot of blood, a lot of gore. Although... They do show some pretty gnarly stuff in this film. Like, there's there's some moments in the film where you can clearly see that, okay, this scene has been altered in some way. They've, like, they've cut away from things before any of the real violence happens. But in other cases, it's extremely up close and personal with the, uh, with the sort of blood and guts of it all. I think particularly of um, the scene in which the class uh the class pet hamster is attacked by uh the cockroaches and it's a legitimately distressing scene you see this little hamster rushing around this cardboard maze trying to outrun these little creatures and we don't see the ultimate sort of aftermath of that there's a moment where a child sort of approaches the maze to get the hamster out and he just goes like ooh and then he's like brought away by the teacher who like looks disgusted but like that's kind of enough we can like fill in those blanks and it's it's pretty legitimately distressing there's also a sequence in which they are performing an autopsy on um on a man's body and his entire uh like chest cavity is just full of these insects like, all of his internal organs have just been consumed, and now he is just full to bursting with bugs. And it's it's horrible. It's, it's absolutely disgusting to look at. It was legitimately made me a little queasy. For those of you who haven't seen this film, 
it's pretty straightforward in terms of plot. The main character is a surgeon uh, who is beginning to sort of lose his nerve. He is struggling with uh, addiction to alcohol, and he is he is put on a leave of absence uh, from his job, and so he moves to this tiny little island out in the middle of uh, I think it's. I don't know exactly where it's supposed to be placed. I think it's in Maine somewhere, uh, which I th- um, he has put on a leave of absence from his uh, from his position at the hospital and chooses to move to an island uh, off of uh, off of the American coast, where he sort of immediately runs into the locals there. Uh, he sort of gets off on the wrong foot with all of them. He buys this rundown little house uh, and is in the process of sort of trying to trying to renovate it when an outbreak of a particular uh, species of cockroach begins on the island. The film has, I think, a lot in common with like a Stephen King story. It feels very much inspired by uh, a lot of his short uh, his short story work. I was thinking a lot uh, about the made-for-TV um, adaptation of Storm of the Century by King, which is a story about um, a small uh, main town which is caught in the midst of a snowstorm, uh, and they are sort of... They're, basically, the devil arrives and, and tells them that they have to sacrifice a child um, or sacrifice multiple children. It's been a while since I've seen the film, um, but they have to sacrifice at least one child Um, in order to bring the storm to an end. A storm is coming. The kind you can't prepare for. The last one of the century. And it has... It has a lot of the same sort of vibes. Um, It also reminds me a lot of uh, Needful Things. Castle Rock Entertainment and Stephen King invite you to visit Castle Rock, Maine, a quiet little town whose population has just increased by one. Do you believe in the devil, Father? I guess I have to. You can't have one without the other. The ways that Stephen King sort of writes stories about towns that sort of begin to unravel... Um, as some sort of like supernatural pressure is is applied to them. Stephen King is an author who has had a lot of influence on the horror genre, um, and in some ways greater influence than I uh, even knew. One of my favorite podcasts uh, to listen to is Just King Things from uh, the team at Range Touch. And on that show, um, listening to that show, I've sort of come to realize that Stephen King really uh, shaped modern horror in a way that um, I I couldn't fully comprehend until I uh, sort of started reading through a lot of his books. You know, there's his short story collection, Four Past Midnight. That book sort of predicted the shape of creepypasta, of internet horror. You know, there's a couple of stories in there, The Sun Dog specifically, which um, is... It's just a creepypasta story. Um, it is, it's pretty extraordinary. And, you know, Stephen King himself, he's not a very original uh, writer. You know, all of the, all of the topics, all of the subjects that he was sort of, uh, you know, exploring in, in his own work, it had already existed in the culture before he came around. But man, he really, he really exploded it. He just, you know, made it so big. It's hard to deny that these these spaces, um, these you know horror um, genre spaces that we're sort of talking about, they they wouldn't exist in the same way without his uh, without his work. I don't think. And yeah, so they nest. I was thinking a lot about um, Stephen King's stories, the way that he tells these stories uh, in in his work. I think as well about the experience of having watched. Cabin by the Lake a few weeks ago uh, for the show. That movie as well was made for television and featured um, some sort of really distressing moments, um, some particularly sort of graphic depictions of uh, women drowning and sort of what that experience is like. 
and we got very sort of up close and personal with them as they, uh, you know, struggled to breathe and they just sort of faded away. Made for TV movies are not really a thing that I sort of have a lot of experience with personally. Here in New Zealand, made for TV movies, they don't really exist or not, not in the way that they sort of seemed to in the US. I think that made for TV movies are no longer really a thing that like properly exists. But for a while throughout sort of the 90s and, you know, early 2000s, um, made for TV movies were kind of a big deal. And that wasn't really the case here. We did not just because of the way that sort of the New Zealand um, sort of film system worked or or sort of continues to work, because of the way that our sort of governing body works, um, specifically in relation to funding of, um, of the arts, if a film was going to be made here in New Zealand, it's going to see theatrical release in sort of 99% of cases. It's very rare that you will see a film be made in New Zealand that doesn't get some sort of theatrical run. Um, I I know a couple of filmmakers personally um, through sort of university and things like that who have made feature films um, which have not seen uh, theatrical wide theatrical release, but uh, those films even then they're made for sort of like festival circuits and things like that. They're not made just to be broadcast on television the way that sort of this type of film, Cabin by the Lake or They Nest, sort of was. Our broadcasters here in New Zealand, we've really only got sort of two major uh, broadcasters and they're not sort of in the business of, of funding movies to be to be made. They, they're involved in funding television shows and things like that, but those are, you know, it's it's easier in some ways for them to invest in uh, making a television series because they'll be able to have that television series running for an extended period of time. Whereas with a film, if they were to fund that, they get to rerun it whenever they would like, but it's not the type of thing that you can put on week after week after week without people getting sick of it. We don't have channels here like the Sci-Fi Network, for example, which broadcast all of these sorts of movies and sort of lower budget sort of genre cinema here in New Zealand we just we just don't have that our our television and sort of film infrastructure doesn't exist in a place where that can um where that sort of filmmaking can really flourish it used to back in the day um obviously that's where Peter Jackson got his start was in this sort of lower budget genre fair but there's been a lot of changes in the past, you know, however many decades it's been since that sort of uh, filmmaking was produced. All of that is to say that, yes, I don't have much experience with made-for-television movies. And I'm finding through this show that they're actually really exciting. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying the experience of having watched these films. Um, I find them really sort of technically interesting. Um, they tend to be like a lot of the lower budget stuff that we've covered um, on this show and on Take Two. Um, so some of the sort of more independent uh, cinema, the, the you know, shot on video films that we've covered and things like that. They tend to be a, um, a space for filmmakers to experiment and to sort of play and to develop their craft. This particular film was uh, directed by by a filmmaker who is named, I want to make sure that I get the pronunciation of this correct, so please bear with me, Ellery Alkayim, is I believe how you pronounce his name. If I have gotten that wrong, I'm very, very sorry. He is a director who is actually from Christchurch, New Zealand, same as me. And he would go on to direct um, a number of Return of the Living Dead sequels, he would direct Without a Paddle, uh, Nature's Calling in 2009. He would also direct Eight-Legged Freaks, which was the film that I was sort of thinking of when I was sort of seeing this on the on the docket. I was like, oh, of course, it's, it's a bug movie. The 2000s had a lot of bug movies and a lot of sort of animal-based horror movies. So I'm thinking um, things like 
anaconda, snakes on a plane, um, eight-legged freaks. And it sort of makes sense that this uh, this film was directed by uh, the director of Eight-Legged Freaks. That was just a complete coincidence. I, I had originally sort of been thinking in my head, like, oh, I'm going to get to make a bunch of Eight-Legged Freaks jokes, and isn't that going to be great? And um, no, it turns out it's the exact same guy. And this guy, Ellery LKM, he got his start here in New Zealand. His big breakout film was a little short film funded through the New Zealand Film Commission called Larger Than Life, which is a little 13-minute black and white homage to the sort of creature films of the 1950s. So films like Them and the original The Fly. Another, I think, allusion to Stephen King. Um, another another sign of his influence, um, you know, making a throwback to these sort of 1950s creature features. That's another Stephen King trademark. You know, I think about stories like the Tommy Knockers. That is a, you know, throwback to these stories about um, about little green men and flying saucers. These sorts of older science fiction stories. And Larger Than Life, I think, is sort of a part of that. It's it's a film that is, you know, a clear throwback to um, 1950s creature features. That film got him uh, some sort of recognition from producers overseas who brought him on board to direct uh, Eight-Legged Freaks. And um, in the process of sort of making that film in the sort of pre-production stages, it would appear that he uh, also was approached to develop this film, They Nest. And this sort of, from what I can tell, just sort of doing uh, my own research, it would seem that this film was sort of like a, a test run for him. It was sort of a way of the producers sort of proving to themselves that, hey, this guy can direct. Um, he has, you know, some filmmaking capabilities. Um, he's able to work with a larger budget and on, you know, a feature length project. And that's that's kind of great. That's like, that's really cool to see. For, for me, I find that really interesting. I find that really exciting. You can see like a direct line from... Okay, he made this little short film, and then he gets brought on board to direct this big horror film um, that's, you know, got pretty major stars in it. And okay, in between there, we need to like, we need to prove to ourselves, we need to make sure that we're not making a mistake here. So let's give him this other project to work on, and we'll see how he does. And that will, that will inform sort of our decision making going forwards. That's really cool. I think that's like, that's the kind of behind the scenes information that I am like interested in, that I care to hear about. Nowadays, people don't really get their start in made for TV movies. Instead, they just work on television series. That seems to be sort of the natural progression is that um, as made for TV movies have been sort of phased out and as uh, prestige television has sort of come to the fore, People now get their start working on those shows. They'll direct, you know, a handful of episodes. They'll write a handful of episodes of, of a show like Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon. And that's sort of where they'll get their start. That's where they'll break out. And that's all well and good. Like, that, that makes sense. As I said, it seems like a pretty natural progression. But at the same time, I do wish that there was more of this type of filmmaking uh, sort of being done nowadays. I suppose in some ways all of that sort of transitioned into YouTube. Um, that's transitioned into that, uh, that sort of space, um, into, into online spaces like YouTube and Vimeo, um, where people are able to sort of publish themselves and they're able to sort of put it out direct to an audience and it's, you know, a little bit sort of more one-to-one -one like that. But still, I don't know. I wish um, I, I wish that there was more of this sort of weird, low-budget genre cinema that was just sort of being being made and broadcast, you know, to these to these wide audiences on on television. I just I think that that's I think it's a shame that this um, that this type of thing has has gone away, or that it's at least a lot harder to find than it was. I wish that it existed more in New Zealand. At the very least, I wish that. Um, you know, more people in New Zealand were exposed to genre cinema in this way because really we only get 
the big sort of tent pole movies. We get the franchise movies. So we get, you know, we get Scream, we get Evil Dead Rise, but we don't get a lot of the sort of smaller stuff. You know, Bo is Afraid, for instance, that's not coming to major cinemas here in New Zealand. It is getting a theatrical release, but it's in the more sort of art house uh, cinemas and things like that, which means that less people are going to see it. It means that less people are exposed to it. As I said, the, these sorts of things, they exist on um, they exist on YouTube now. They exist on the internet. But if you're not already in those spaces, it's very hard to find them. You know, I, I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't think that my partner, for instance, who like does enjoy uh, genre cinema, but is not, who is not invested in genre cinema the same way that I am, I don't think that she would know at all about any of the stuff that's going on with like found footage stuff with ARGs with um, analog horror as well as like truly independent um, sort of stuff like uh, Louis Weird's Computer Hearts um, from 2013 and things like that I don't think that like my wife would be able to find any of that stuff I don't know if she would have any idea we'd even begin looking for any of that stuff and so I wish that these sorts of things, like, we, we have this idea in our heads, I think, that the internet is this place of, like, true self-expression and that, like, you know, you can always find your people on the internet. You're always going to be able to find these, these communities and these community spaces. And in some ways that's true, but at the same time, you've got to know how to navigate it all. And a lot of people don't. I think that a lot of sort of the general audience, uh, you know, general general consumers, I should say, I don't think that they know how to navigate the internet in that way to find these spaces. Um, you know, they're they're just going to stay sort of on the on the surface level. They're going to interact with you know Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, and they're not really going to dive any deeper than that. They're not really going to go and explore these places in the same way that, um, you know, somebody like like I would, because they're not as invested as I am. And so I wish that, um, you know, these, these types of lower budget projects were more visible and made for TV movies. I'm sh like, there's, there's tons of stories about how these types of films got people into horror movies. Trevor Henderson, um, Slimy Swamp Ghost, on Twitter, he's spoken a number of times about the ways that um, being exposed to these like made for TV movies and, um, you know, those those children's horror TV shows and things like that growing up, that was how he got into um, genre. And I just I don't really know if um, that sort of pipeline exists anymore. I think that um, I think that instead people are going to have to look a little bit harder. They're going to have to dig a little bit deeper to be sort of exposed to any of that sort of stuff, to be exposed to this sort of content. I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit here. I don't know exactly how true that is. You know, I I can only speak from sort of my experience, but, um, you know, that's just sort of what I've observed Having interacted with children, um, having interacted with um, teenagers and things like that nowadays, I, I think that um, in in my experience, culture has been a little more homogenized. And so, yeah, I don't know. I just I I wish I suppose that um, more people were exposed to contents like this. This has been kind of an interesting discussion. I didn't think that um, I would have all that much to say on on this episode because the film itself is like it, it's pretty great. I really enjoyed the experience of watching it and things like that. But there's not a huge amount to dig into uh, thematically. The filmmaking is like is good. It's really competent. It's you know a good looking fun movie. I think if you put this on, watched it with an audience, you would have a great time. But I find it in some ways a lot harder to talk about films that I enjoy um, more than I do with films that I dislike. I find it really sort of easy to unpack those films. I think that you'll have uh, sort of picked this up. Some of the feedback that I've gotten on this show is that, um, yeah, the episodes where I like the films, they're 
in some ways a little uh they're they're a little more boring than the uh episodes where i dislike the film because i just i don't have as much to say about the things that i like as i do about the things that i dislike which you know i so that that's true i'm a hater to my core uh <laughs> thank you so much for listening I'd like to thank Yanka Glonis for the use of her track Slime Dripping Down the Walls off of the album Fun Time Party Gal. A link to that album and to their band camp can be found in the episode description. If you have any comments or queries regarding the show and you want to get in touch, you can do that on Twitter at MostMaligned or via email MostMaligned at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd ask that you please consider supporting the show on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash most maligned, where for just $5 a month, you'll receive exclusive access to Take Two, a semi-weekly show offering critical analysis and contextualization of those films which have not made it onto the main feed. If you head over there right now, you'll find uh, an episode discussing The Prophecy 3, The Ascent, starring Christopher Walken. As well, if you could please take a moment to leave a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice, I would really appreciate that. Next week on the show, we're discussing another uh, independent film. This time it is July 2000's The St. Francisville Experiment. Until then, though, this has been The Most Maligned Pro Podcast.